because the Lord has a word for us. And as I was studying and praying and going after the Lord and what he has. Now, some of you know that uh, I've been talking, I've been teaching out of the book of John. Right? Are you, are you with me? I've been teaching a lot out of the book of John. And one of the things that struck me when, I, when the Lord was speaking to me to go into the book of John was the fact that uh, just this one verse, John chapter 20 and verse 31. And so I'm going to kind of hit this a lot because it's so important. And it literally is the why the book of John was written. But I think it can even be expanded to why the Bible is here. Um, today I'm going to be preaching out of the book of John chapter 12 and then some other verses. But John chapter 20 and verse 31 um, is just a powerful, powerful verse. And it very simply says this. John writes saying, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. That's John chapter 20 and verse 31. And I really see it and I'm, I'm, it's in my spirit as like an anthem or a theme to the book of John. And like I said, to the entire Bible. So you'll probably see me just hit that verse constantly because that's kind of exciting to know why. And the why is a good why. Wouldn't you agree with me, sis? Like the why is a good why. He wants us to have this word so that we would first know that Jesus is the Christ, the chosen, the anointed of God, that he is the son of God. He's not just somebody out there that did good and can help us out. He is the son of God. It says, and that believing you, come on, wave your hand right now and say me, me, that I, that you, that we could have life. How? In his name. Because no matter how good I get to preaching or anyone can get to preaching or teaching, if it is not Jesus, there is no power, there is no life, there is no worth, there is no victory on it. Can somebody say amen? I don't care how good it is. I don't care how bomb it smells. I don't care if it's the bomb dot com or whatever adjective we want to give to it but the reality is we have got to realize that everything we have was come through him come on the life we have the blessings we have the relationships we have needs to be in jesus name through his great name and what he's instructing us to do are you with me now i'll be the first to tell you my boo is fine are you turning red dear my wife is beautiful. With all due respect, my wife is beautiful. She's very smart and she's very intelligent. But when she was just my girlfriend and I just didn't have Jesus, she didn't have Jesus, it was hell. It was ugly. It was dark. It was demonic. It didn't matter how beautiful she was, how smart she was, how I don't know what she sees in me. Actually, the Lord blinded the woman so that she would marry me. But the reality is it didn't matter how good it was because apart from Jesus, what did we produce? Two beautiful children, but they were dying. We produced death, the fights, the arguments, everything. And so there's good things in life, but if it's good, that's not enough for it to be life and for it to be God. Come on. I'm going to talk today about the spirit that was in Judas. I'm not talking about the spirit of Judas because I don't truly believe that it is a spirit of Judas. I believe the spirit was at work. I believe there's some antichrist elements. It could be an antichrist spirit. I believe there are some elements of witchcraft or rebellion. We could label some of it the, the witchcraft, the rebellion. But the reality is the, the kingdom of darkness works together well. Come on, when you were an addict, when you were a, an alcoholic, when you were just a grumpy old man or a grumpy young woman or whatever it was, didn't it work together with your depression? Didn't didn't it work together with your addiction? Didn't it work together with your fears? Didn't it work together with your insecurities? Come on, because that's what the kingdom of darkness does. And I believe that is a, uh, an illustration of what was done in Judas' life. But the reality that I want to speak about is it was Judas' decision. Come on. If you look at what the scholars and what historians write about Judas, they don't say, nobody says Judas walked around with horns ah, and, you know, walked around looking like a devil, ah, no tooth, snaggle tooth and all that, right? That's what we think right away. 
Well, Jesus had some disciples. Peter was crazy. But Judas probably walked around looking like a devil. No, that's not the case at all. When you look at historians and scholars and even some of the reasons why Judas may have made the decisions. Now, here's the deal. I'm going to say this. It's not in the word why Judas made the decisions that he made. It doesn't tell us his whole thought process, but I'm going to touch on this just a little bit. But many would say that Judas was betraying Jesus because he thought that if Judas would hand Jesus over, he never thought Jesus would go to the cross. He never thought Jesus would, would lay his life down. He thought he was going to force Jesus to raise up and be the king of heaven's army, the general of heaven's army. He felt like, maybe he felt like he was going to force Jesus' hand. He would betray Jesus and Jesus would be like Samson and finally he'd have to throw off the, the shackles, throw off the chains and he'd have to overcome. Many will say that Judas was doing these things to change the oppression Impressive uh, trajectory that Israel was under. Are you with me? So, so does that make some sense? I know that's a little bit of an intellectual argument and discussion. It's at least intellectual for me. But Judas didn't necessarily, maybe he didn't think that he was doing an evil thing. He thought maybe, maybe he thought that he was doing things his way. Judas was, was chosen and given opportunities and blessings as he walked with Jesus, but it was not enough to get him to change his heart to follow Jesus. Like I said, many people would say that what he wanted was for Jesus to rise up and fight against the oppression of Israel. But the reality is if we, we, we all have some Judas tendencies in us. We all have some of those things that afflicted Judas at work within us. The reality is we need to be a people who are actively choosing to hear and obey the Lord now more than ever. Because I'll tell you something, the media has some stuff they want you to hear, they want you to obey, they want you to follow through with, but they're not giving you the whole truth. Come on, your friends, your neighbor, your loved ones, come on, how many of you know that your governor is asking you, the, I, I know for sure it's been stated in California, and it wouldn't surprise me to hear if it happened here in Colorado, but they're asking you, they're asking that if you would, if you would, uh, if you'd snitch on your neighbors if they've got too many people gathering, come on. Right? The reality is, I seen a, uh, a little thing on the internet the other day, and it said, you know what? You want to be cool and not snitch on your neighbors, because the, your government's not going to jumpstart your car. Your government's not going to hold an extra key to your house. Your government's not going to pick up an Amazon package from you. But the government wants you to snitch on your neighbor and turn neighbor against neighbor. Now, that's not Bible, but that's, come on, some common sense here. See, there are a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, information, a lot of things that are coming against just what it is to be a man of God, what it is to be a woman of God, how we are to operate as child, children of God. One of the things that Judas was is this word. He was contrary to the things of God. The spirit, of, the spirit that worked inside of Judas was constantly contrary to the word, to the work, and to the glory of God. Now remember, I'm preaching Jesus in a minute. It's going to get good. But let's talk about Judas. Let's not shy away. Because as I said, he wasn't a horn-sporting, snaggletooth. You know, he may have been the best looking among the disciples. I don't know. But the reality was Judas was constantly contrary to the word, the work, and the glory of God. If you are contrary to the word, to the work, and bringing glory to God, you know what? You may be operating in that same spirit. The word contrary means this. It means perversely inclined to disagree. It's one thing to disagree, but it says perversely inclined. In other words, what I'm looking, the way I'm looking at it is not the right way. I've got a bad vision. I've got bad understanding or I've got no understanding, but I'm against something. Come on. Some people that choose to vote for one side or the other are very simply stating, well, I just don't like this person, so I'm going to vote this way. Come on. That's not a real argument. See, and that's what contrary is. Contrary is a perverse inclination to disagree or to do the opposite of what is expected, desired, or good. 
And a lot of us, and Judas, I believe, had this thing where he was so willing to be a contrarian. That's someone who's contrary. I, I found these words this week, so I'm going to use them. Help me out, saints. It's good. So go with me to the book of John chapter 12. And we are, we're going to launch in. We're going to look at some of what Judas had done. And I want to talk to some people today because you've got some people in your life that are acting contrarian. You've got some circumstances and some situations in your life that are contrary. Come on. That are coming against you. That are working to disagree. But the reality is if you will walk with Jesus. Come on. I didn't say if you will walk with Joe Biden. I didn't say if you will walk with Donald Trump I said if you will walk with Jesus if we will be children of the kingdom come on we will have some contrary winds blowing against us John chapter 12 launching off in verse 1 um, got a bunch of scriptures but we're gonna see we're gonna learn we're gonna get something today right Verse 1, then six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany where Lazarus was who had been dead, whom he had raised from the dead. Come on, this is Jesus' work right here. Come on, here's the deal. How many of us are Lazarus? We were dead. Some of you are Lazarus and you still are dead. But the reality was he whom he had raised from the dead. Because that's what Jesus does. He brings us from death to life. You didn't do it on your own. You didn't do it because it was your good idea. It's what Jesus is doing. Verse 2. There they made him supper and Martha served. But Lazarus was one of those who sat at the table with him. Praise God. He raised Lazarus from the dead. Lazarus had a spot at the table. Verse 3. Then Mary took a pound of very costly oil of spikenard, anointed the feet of Jesus, and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the oil. Come on. The Bible teaches us that I can bless God. Come on, the Bible teaches us that I can bless God. I was just talking about it before service. Psalm chapter 33 talks about how the praises of the upright are a beautiful thing. Come on, this woman right here, Mary, is blessing God. Come on, I want to tell you, if you've been given something by God, your brother's saved, your sister's saved, you're saved, you're filled with the Holy Ghost, we have every reason to be excited. And when the king comes around, we should be blessing him. We should be spending on him. We should be honoring we should be giving him something. Come on, right now, let's just take a moment to give him some praise. And it filled the house with a fragrance. But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, who would betray him, said, what does he say? Why was this fragrant oil not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? Wow, that sounds pretty awesome. Great idea. Nobody thought about that. But let's look at the next verse. This he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because, the, because he was a thief. And he had the money box. And he used to take what was put in it. Come on, he makes one good statement, but the reality is, come on, we're good as people. Like, hey, I want to do something good. And so here it is. You know, the reality is, if Jesus is not in the midst, you know what? We can come up with some good ideas, but there's a lot of ands in there. You look at this. this what is it? Verse, uh, verse 5, verse 6, rather. He said this not because he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief. And he had the money. And he used to take what was put in it. Maybe, you know what, we're good at kidding ourselves. We're good at, at uh, what is it, uh, at justifying what we do, at reasoning why we do something or why we would want something to happen. But the reality is, come on, Jesus is, is worth spending on. The reality is we've got to follow his leadership because a God, our Father in heaven, has a heavenly perspective. We ourselves have to admit, confess, believe, and follow this word. We have to admit, confess, and believe that we don't have a heavenly perspective. Best case scenario, our perspective is, is small and limited. Right? Best case, my perspective is small and limited, and it's not because I'm only 5'2". Worst case scenario, my perspective is demonic. I don't care if you're six, seven. Best case scenario in your eight pound mind, I think that's what brains weigh, but in your mind, 
Your perspective is small and limited. Worst case, it is demonic. What did I write? I wrote this the other day. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, right? In other words, he gets us to the place where we need to go. He, he deals with us in truth and in the real, in the reality, in the natural, and in the spiritual, in the fullness, the truth. Come on, sometimes we water that down. But Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. We've got to realize that I am the detour, the deceived, and the might. I might get something to happen, but Jesus is the one that makes life happen for real did you catch that I said we are the detour the deceived and the might not strong might but the might maybe come on or the wishy-washy come on I'm not the same as I was six weeks ago I'm not the same as I was six years ago I'm not the same as I was 10 years ago come on the reality is but Jesus is the same yesterday today and forever and his perspective is the perspective of heaven his perspective is the perspective that's going to get that seat filled and that seat filled and that seat filled and that seat filled and I'm not talking about because I don't like empty seats I don't care but I don't want my family in hell I don't want my neighbor going to hell I don't want my nephew going to hell that's why those seats got to be filled. Because we're filling up the kingdom. But what does Lazarus, or not Lazarus, what does Judas say? He said a good thing. Mary, you shouldn't have wasted all that oil. It's on the floor now. Now it smells like anointing in here. Come on, I want to tell you something. You got a wrong spirit. You ain't going to like the scent of the anointing. Yeah. Woo! And I love the way the anointing smells. I'll tell you what, even in the past six months, been in some situations, and I get around some people, or I get around a, a, a certain altar call, and sometimes I'm tripping. It takes some repenting for me to really begin to enjoy how the Spirit's moving in some, and it's not because of them, it's because of stuff that goes on in me. Come on, I'm talking today because there is often contrary Moves, contrary actions, contrary advice. I want to speak this to everybody in the house, everybody online right now. You are in the safest place you can be. Not because COVID is not a danger, but because you are in the plumb line of the will of God, hearing the word of God, confronting the contrary Judas spirits and advice that are working against us. I'm telling you today, we've got to start to do things Jesus' way because he is the way. You are not the way there's a way that seems right to a man but in the end it leads to destruction come on I'm talking today because I want the next time when I get COVID I want the next time when I get the flu I want the next time when I go to prison for preaching Jesus you know what I want to happen the next time I want some people to call me and tell me pastor get me in that building Next time, I'm unavailable. I'm in a hospital bed. I'm traveling to Tahiti. I don't want this building to shut down. I get COVID-32. I don't want the building to shut down. I want some saints to rise up. I want somebody to call me and say, Pastor, Ledger wants to preach the gospel. Well, let him in the building. Turn on the microphone. Turn on the open sign and bring somebody to the altar. I'm not mad at nobody. But I'm warning everybody. This is what I'm raising up. Why? Not because I'm bad and tough and this and that. Because this is what Jesus said. He said, I'm a gift to you. He said, the pastors, the teacher, the prophet, the evangelist, and the apostle, we are gifts to you. Not so we can go to the hospital and give you your last rites. Oh, I hope you go with Jesus. No, I'm a gift to you so that I could equip you for the work of ministry. You're the preacher. You're the prophet. You're the vessel the Holy Spirit is using. Come on, the Judases that are around, they don't like it when the fragrance of the knowledge of God is going out. But who cares what Judas thinks when there's a God, the God of all creation, Jesus, the Son of the living God, came to give us life and life abundantly. It's time for us to start living it. Yeah. 
saints, this is the real deal. It's time to stand up today like never before. Don't be fooled. Judas was close to Jesus for a long time. Don't be fooled. G Judas was in charge of the money box for maybe the whole, the whole time he was in ministry. So I'm saying this to you. Don't be fooled proximity or how close you are. Don't be fooled the position you have. That does not necessarily mean you have the approval of God. Proximity and position is not always approval. Come on. Jesus knew Judas was a liar, but he gave him the chance to walk with integrity. You might have a blessing. Don't be fooled. Proximity and position isn't always approval. Just because you are at the king's table does not automatically give you his heart. Remember, I said at the beginning, what did I say? We have to actively choose to hear and obey him. We have to want him. We have to make space for him. Come on, saints, I am telling you today, like never before, completely apart from the political arena, come on, there shouldn't be, we, we should not be so tore up over uh, the political situation. We should be excited because we live as part of the kingdom. And if we were truly living as part of the kingdom, it would be our blessing to come down into a political situation and speak life and bring our vote and bring our blessing blessing and carry the anointing into it but the reality is each and every one of us has a call that is higher it is the call to the kingdom of God I don't care if you're a plumber a janitor I don't care if you're, you're you, you got an entry level job data entry at Walmart and it's, it, it's the worst hours I don't care the reality is you've been given that job to pay your bills and to make disciples come on you've been given that job so that you can go into that place and bring people to Jesus there were times that Paul the apostle was in prison and the sound of his chains pre chains preach the gospel to people Amen. so I'm going to say this to some people some church people today proximity and position do not equal God's approval sometimes you'll get the position sometimes you'll be close to where God is moving but it's so that you can catch the fire and you can walk in truth are you following his lead Go with me to Luke chapter 22, verse 2. We're talking about some, we're just, we're touching on some things Judas went through. But remember, I'm preaching Jesus this morning. His leadership, what he wants from us. Saints, this is an amazing time. Man, our Bible got turned around. This is an amazing time in the kingdom. But we've got to come under his leadership. What does it say? Luke chapter 22. Amen when y'all get there. I'll leave it there, bro. It is. Verse 2, Luke chapter 22, verse 2. We're looking at Judas again. The chief, and the, the chief priests and the scribes saw how they might kill him, for they feared the people. Look, at, I'm going to say something right here. This is prophetic right here. This points to the moment that we're in right now. Because look at you've got religious leaders. You've got influential people. And what are they doing? They're seeking how they might take Jesus out. Why? Because they fear the people. I want to say this. There's some politicians. There's some leaders. There's some influential people that want to take the church out. Why? Because they fear the people. Because there are demonically filled and inspired people that want to take the church out. But the reality is, you can, even if they kept me from coming into this building, Building. I've got to carry revival everywhere I go. That's why I say the next time I catch something, the next time I catch this or that, I want to say this just to clear, clear the air right now, okay? If I ever go to jail, it's for Jesus, it's for this word, it's for the gospel. I ain't playing games with no dope. I ain't playing games with no, with no nothing, no nonsense, no illegal nothing. But when they make this word illegal, you better believe that I come under a greater law. I come under the law of the kingdom. Come on. It would be better for me to obey God than to obey men. Come on. And the reality is, remember I was talking about Judas and how he carries that contrary spirit. Same thing. Here he is right here with these chief priests and scribes and he sought how they might kill him. Why? For they feared the people. Come on, I'm not called to fear this city. I'm not called to fear so-and-so. I'm not called to fear a group of people. You know what I'm called to fear? I'm called to fear God, and I'm called to influence people. I'm called to bring people to my Father. 
I'm called to invite people into the kingdom. I'm called to, you know what? Devils should fear me. Straight up, sickness should fear me. Well, pastor, didn't it hurt, wasn't it? You know what? I'll tell you what. I had some body aches I've never had when I was sick. For about an, a couple hours, I really started tripping, like fear, depression, anxiety, like, man, I messed up. Like, am I out of your will, Father? And then, you know what? Father just speaks, and what does he say? Son, I'm right here with you. Of course, there's a contrary wind blowing. Of course, something's coming against you. But I'm right here with you. Let's go. But Father, then we've got to open these doors. I better get over there. we got to pack the church out again or we're never going to do what you said. He said, that's just it. He said, you think you're going to do what I said? He said, you just get where I've called you to be and I will make happen what I said. Yeah. See, sometimes we're, that's us. Well, I want to do what you said. Here's the thing. You know what you do? You love him first. You obey him. You follow his leadership and don't think you're going to do it your own way. He's the one that said he would do it. So here we are, the chief priests, the scribes, they're looking to take Jesus out because they fear the people. Come on, we've got to stop fearing people. Right now, the church is going through, you know what, here's the thing, some churches are being tested because who do I fear? Do I fear the people or do I fear God? I've had people tell me, well, we will not be back at your church then unless you make everybody do this, unless you do that. We will not be back at your church. I love you and I would love to be, you know, to, to lead and walk this life out with you, but praise God then. I'm not going to drag you along because I don't have the energy. I'm not going to fear people. Verse 3. Then Satan entered Judas, surnamed Iscariot, who was numbered among the twelve. Remember, like I said, just Judas doesn't walk around looking like a, a snaggletooth, horned, you know, whatever, however you think evil looks. He's, you know what, he, he, he's just there among the twelve. How do we know this, that he doesn't look different? Because when Jesus goes on to tell the disciples that, hey, one of you at this table is going to betray me, everybody at the table is like, who is it, me? Oh, come on. The reality is everybody knew they had some darkness in their heart. But only Judas was contrary to the Lord who was like, oh, no, nah. give me some bread. <laughs> then Satan entered Judas, surnamed Iscariot, who was numbered among the 12, verse 4. So he went his way. Come on, that's a Judas, that, I'm, I'm going to tell you something. That's a Judas move, that's a Judas tactic right there. Whose way did Judas go? His own, his own way. He went his way and conferred with the chief priests, the captains, how he might betray him to them. So let me ask you, are you following Jesus' lead or are you having contrary conversations somewhere else? Right there, where's Judas having a contrary conversation with some chief priests and some captains? Oh, but they're influencers. Oh, but they're this. Oh, but they're that. Oh, but they're going to pay me. You know, God wants me to pay my bills. Yes, he does, but he wants you to trust him while they're getting paid. Come on. He ain't called you to no sin. He, but the reality is Judas had already kept it in his heart that he was going to be contrary to the Lord. Then Satan, or verse uh, 5, here we are. And they were glad and agreed to give him money. I'm telling you something. When the world starts getting glad with you, coming in agreement with you, and when the world's your blessing, you better watch out. When the people that are coming against the church are your blessing, because you walk carrying the greatest kingdom ever. And everywhere you go, you should be a representative of that kingdom. Just give your life to Jesus today. Lay it all down. For, leave it all behind and let him clean you up. Let him pull you out of that job, which he will quickly. Let him pull you out of that hell hole, which he will quickly. Come on, that's why he came, to give us life and life abundantly, not to keep us in a place where, place where death is being cultivated. I don't know, that was a rabbit trail. That was for somebody, that was for me, praise God. Verse five, they were glad they agreed to get, and agreed to give him money. Verse 6, so he promised and sought opportunity to betray him to them in the absence of the multitude. Look, at he's still having his issue, fearing people. 
because he won't do it when everybody's around. Check this out, though. The reality is, saints, if you were to keep reading, here's your homework assignment. Keep reading Luke 22. Jesus is still in the midst of his betrayal. And this is what I want to, this is where I'm starting to declare what Jesus wants us to do as a people. In the midst of his betrayal, in the midst of his difficulty, you keep reading Luke chapter 22. Jesus is still setting divine appointments. Come on, he's still making the godly connections. He sends the disciples that have not betrayed, excuse me, he sends the disciples that have not betrayed him, he sends them off <coughs> so that they can meet the man who would give them the upper room to use. Even in the midst of his betrayal, Jesus is still honoring past institutions and blessings from God. You see that as you keep reading Luke chapter 22, and you see he's observing the Passover. Come on, those are a couple of things right there. Sometimes we get a contrary wind blowing against us. Come on, Judas is straight up a contrary force. The devil is straight up a contrary force working against Jesus. But you see, he still is setting divine appointments. I want to say this to you. You still need to keep your divine appointments. Did you catch that? Again, like I said before, he's honoring past institutions and blessings from God. Jesus is as he observes the Passover. Some of us, we get a contrary wind blowing and we stop honoring the thing that God did in the past. Come on, we got a bad news. We, we get a bad report from the doctor. We get a bad report from the parole office. We get a bad report from our job. We, our company just got bad out and they're going to they're gonna, uh, strike out our position that we had. They're not going to give us the raise we thought we wanted. We've got a contrary wind blowing against us. And so what do we do? We start, we, we start looking for every way to be a solution and we let go of the things of God. But Jesus kept honoring the past institutions and blessings like I said, we see that as he observes the Passover. Another thing, come on, sometimes things start happening. I, I, it happened to me for like, I'm, I'm serious, a good four or five hours, like I was tripping in my bed, like just flipping out about all kinds of stuff. Man, the devil really started wrestling with me, kind of threw me all over the room for a minute. Not literally, but spiritually. And then I started reading the word. Then I started praying. And then I heard our father say, I'm here with you. He didn't say, oh, my bad. I let it slip through. Let's take it. He said, son, I'm right here. I'm here with you. What, is, what else does Jesus continue doing? He continues prophesying and preaching about the future. Come on, some of us need to, you, you better realize that even in the midst of your contrary wind, even though you've got some Judas tendencies within you or some Judas things working against you, you've still got to speak life. You've got to be prophesying about the future. And, and here's the deal. The reality is, I'm not saying like everybody needs to hear from the Lord and be like, and I declare that I'm going to $10 million by, you know, no, 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 no. First, come on, let's start with these baby steps, saints. Just right here. I may not feel like a son of God this morning. I may not feel like the child of God this morning. But you know what this word says? That as many as believed in Jesus' name, we have the right, the authority to be the children of God. I don't feel like a child of... You know what? It don't matter what you feel. This word tells me... <clears throat> And there will come a time when your feelings and your faith catch up, but that's not how we live every single day. So we see Jesus still prophesying about the future, creating kingdom things. So you know what else he does in Luke chapter 22? He brings forth the institution of communion. He creates, he, he, he says, here's the deal. That's where he breaks bread. He breaks bread and says, this is my body. He pours the wine and says, this is my blood. He says, do this as often as you do in remembrance of me. You know what? I love the institution of communion so that we can, because I love communion. And I'm going to be real with you. You know what? I think, I don't, I don't know me and Pastor Dave have done communion, but I've done communion just with a handful of people here and there in the past few months. But I love communion. We need to get it back in this house. And I'm sorry. It's my fault it's not here. It's, uh, it is here. It is here. I'm not, never going to say it's not here. It's just my fault it's been a couple months. But that's okay. Back to the text. Jesus institutes communion. 
Here's the deal. Jesus doesn't stop confronting and he doesn't stop comforting the heart of man. So I'm saying this to some people this morning. Don't let the presence of a Judas stop the movement of God in your life. Can somebody say amen to that? Don't let the presence of a contrary wind stop the God, stop God from moving in your life. You see Matthew chapter 14. I'm just going to speak these verses. You don't have to go there. The word says immediately Jesus made his disciples get into a boat, go before him to the other side. Well, he sent the multitudes away. Here's the thing. Those that were closest to Jesus get an instruction in Matthew chapter 14 that they have to get into the boat and they got to go to the other side. Verse 24 says, but the boat was now in the middle of the sea, tossed by the waves for the wind was contrary come on it's not the the favor of God is that God is here the favor of God is yes the 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 doctors are going to speak this the favor of God is yes my neighbor is going to speak that my my job is going to speak this my demon infested child is going to speak that but the favor of God is that God is still with me and greater is he that is within me than he that is in this world the the blessing of God is this that the report of the Lord is the one I'm going to believe the blessing of God is that his arm is not shortened, nor is his ear deaf, that he cannot hear, that he's not going to move. Matter of fact, the more difficult it gets, the more intense it gets, the more it's a requirement that we wait on God to move. Judas betrayed Jesus very possibly thinking he was going to accomplish something good. We know at the very least he was sure he was going to do something good for himself. Immediately Jesus spoke to them and said this, be of good cheer. It is I do not be afraid. I've heard it said, I've never counted them, but I've heard there's 365 do not be afraid or fear nots in the Bible. I've never counted them, but I know they're all over. So in them being all over the word of God, we should be all in the word of God and our fear should be all over. Yas duvo, that's it. Some people need to stop saying, I know what I'm doing and pursue the Lord and see what he is doing. Come on, saints, I'm talking to you this morning because some people need to just recognize this, that you know what? There is some contrary within us. There is some darkness within us. You read, I, I believe it's in John where um, Jesus makes the statement that one of you at this table is going to betray me, everybody is like, ooh, is it, is, it, is it me? Is it me? Is it me? And the ones that weren't saying it out loud were probably saying it in their heart because everybody had something in them that when he spoke that, it was like, who catch your breath. You know what I mean? Well, the Bible teaches us this, that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. What we are, what did I say we were? We are the detour, the deceived And we are the might, the maybe, could be. Jesus is the sure thing. The sure thing to do things his way. I'm going to close with this, Matthew chapter 7 and verse 13 and 14. Because the reality is, saints, this is not an easy walk. You can know the will of God. Sometimes you can know the will of God by circumstances. The Lord may open a door. The Lord may do this. The Lord may do that. But as, I, as the Bible taught us earlier, you can't assume that God has approved of you and everything about you, every decision you're making, rather. Let me say that right. You can't assume that God is approving of your lifestyle or your decisions just because you're close or just because of your position. If the Word of God speaks something or the Holy Spirit's convicting you of something, we need to listen. Because sometimes he brings you close or puts you in position because that's his way of getting your attention about your darkness, the darkness of your heart. It's not the easiest walk because we have been trained for so many years in the natural. But I want to train this church, the leaders, me and Pastor Dave, we cry and we want, we, we don't cry, oh, we cry, Lord, lay hold of them. Lord, teach me what to teach them. Lord, show me what I'm missing so that we can give that to them. And the reality is Matthew 7 and 13. 
Enter by the narrow gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go in by it. I want to say this. You know what? There's a lot more people walking righteously than you know. But a lot of times it feels lonely. A lot of times it doesn't seem fair. A lot of times you, you, you get to shaking your head. You get to wondering, you know. But the reality is, we've got to be following Jesus in spite of our circumstances. He says, enter by the narrow gate. Wide is the gate. Broad is the way that leads to destruction. There are many who go in by it. Because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life. And there are few who... F Hi, I'm Pastor Glenn Garcia. And Joey Garcia with New Hope Ministries of Central Denver. And we encourage you to plug into a local home church. And if you don't have one, we welcome you to join us at any one of our services. On any of those services, you can find on Facebook or YouTube Live. Facebook, you can find us under New Hope Ministries of Central Denver. And YouTube, our channel is NHM Central Denver. Thank you for partnering with us as we come alongside you to walk you into your true purpose as it begins now. God bless you and we love you. Thank you.